Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by this. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. How are you? Ikiyo cowboy. Ikiyo <laughs> You have a very odd um gosh, who what singer does that remind me of? I don't I don't I wouldn't even begin to know. That was a horrific <laughs> thing that I just did on the on the <laughs> recording. That was terrible. Uh, it was unique. <laughs> Why who would want that out there? Uh, what kind of idiot would record <laughs> themselves doing that? 
um, <clears throat> I haven't seen anything in the theaters uh, because I am totally, totally absorbed in Game of Thrones. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. I, I want to watch that. I do. Oh, man. I'm, I, uh, you know, so I have the book of the uh, of the game of thrones and i st i've started it like many many times uh but i haven't been able to really get into there are so many characters that it was really impossible to get into and so now i have uh you know it's it uh finally you know after way too long it came out on on itunes and i sprung for it i bought the season it's finally uh -huh. out in the it's finally hbo finally released their cold dead hands their I... icy grip <laughs> are you comparing hbo to charlton heston <laughs> you know what's so you know what makes me so mad uh, you know it's been floating around for a while this uh oatmeal uh cartoon right comic have you seen the oatmeal comic with the guy with the devil on his shoulder and the angel on I, his other shoulder i have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> it's it's really brilliant and uh, you know i i think it is loosely related uh to um uh, to what we're talking about um it's a comic that is that really captures my problem with what is going on in the world today and it specifically relates spe specifically relates to game of thrones which is i think is so funny so if you 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 know the oatmeal.com the comic no okay so it's called you just go to the oatmeal.com oatmeal the oatmeal com slash comics and then it's game yeah. underscore of underscore thrones. Oh, I have seen these guys. I didn't know that's what they were from. Yeah, yeah. So this one specifically is cataloging what happens when uh, he tries to watch Game of Thrones. And it's called, I tried to watch Game of Thrones, and this is what happened. I am the, seeing it right now. The devil on his shoulder. Hey, what you yeah. doing? Just finished reading just Game of Thrones. <laughs> right. Exactly. So he says, you know, he can't get it. Availability is unknown in Netflix. Ah, oh, dang. It's not available for streaming. Why not just pirate it? Yeah, I suppose that's an option. Hold it. It's easy to rationalize piracy when you picture some billionaire fat cat CEO lining his pockets with your money. But what about the author? He's a hardworking, creative individual <clears throat> like Andy Nelson, and he deserves to get paid for his work. <laughs> You know what? You're right. I've got a credit card in hand, and I'm committed to buying this thing. To iTunes we go. But... Of course, uh, thirty eight ninety nine to download the entire season, right? Wrong. The downloads are for some free featurettes. The actual show isn't available yet. Okay, iTunes is out. Try Amazon. So they, he tries all these things to get it, right? And nothing, only clips are available. Stupid, dumb HBO. And just forwards me to HBO.com. Well, let's go to HBO and buy directly from the source. Well, you can't do that because you're not a, you don't have cable. You're a cord cutter. Well, now what? <laughs> and so tapity tapity tap, and there it is—the whole season on uh, a torrent site, I like the torrent page. I know. <laughs> I know, right? It's very lewd. It's lewd. Yes. It's fantastic. Yes. Are you sure about this? Now, instead of the author getting paid, the money is going to those sleazy advertisers. Also, this is illegal, and I'm not sure. Wow, look at how fast it's downloading. That was really easy. And there he's he's downloading yeah. and watching, it. and that <laughs> is like I. But I didn't do it, and I was this close. I really wanted to see it, and I have this credit card in hand, and I want to give them money. I want to give the creators money to watch this show. Right. But it said you have to wait forever, and finally, when it's close to coming out, it's just really dumb. They did take a long time, it didn't they? It took forever. It's just such a dumb... Now, I know there's probably people out there furious with me for even promoting this kind of thing. I'm not promoting it. I, I am promoting giving money to content creators as a content creator. I promote giving money when the content is ready to see the world. Come on. Here, here. So you haven't gotten into it. Let me tell you, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And so back to my story, I'm reading the book, too, at the same time. It's like I practically have the book open while I'm watching the show. It's terrible. I'm addicted to it. <laughs> I'm addicted to it. I I can imagine getting very addicted to it uh, myself. It seems like exactly the sort of thing that I would I would enjoy, mm -hmm. and I just I haven't yet because it just seems so daunting to yeah. take it all on. But well, uh, it, it it ends up it it seems epic, but it's really it, it is epic, but it's only you know it's only ten episodes for season one. So I mean, you can get through that in a day. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I had a day to do that in. <laughs> 
take a day. Put it on the calendar a couple of weeks out. Take a day. Tell everybody to leave you alone. Watch the whole thing. Yes. You should do that. I will. I it's will the, it's actually the first thing, you know, because iTunes, uh, Apple updated a lot of their iTunes, uh, you know, and, and because they, they updated the Apple TV uh, to now st- uh, stream 1080p. And because uh, it was always, you know, 720. I believe it was always 720. I didn't. I don't have that fancy version of the Apple TV. But uh, so I usually just anything I get from iTunes, I get standard def. Um, but I have this big fancy monitor here in my office that is uh, HD. It's 1080, and and uh, so this is the first season that I actually I splurged and I bought in 1080. Wow. It's, it's so good. Right. It's like you can see I, I'm looking spit. very forward to that one. I, I won't uh, deny it. I really do oh, want to see it. It's so good. We're not, uh, not going to talk about that today, though, anymore. We're done with that. We have another fantastic movie. I don't even know how to have a coherent conversation about this movie. <laughs> Let's have an incoherent conversation. Oh my gosh! Do, do you know what I mean? Like, I found myself trying to talk to my wife about it over dinner tonight, and like every single sentence, you know, ends with a ridiculous quote. Like, I can't describe what happens because I'm too busy quoting the movie. Mm-hmm. It's an easy one for that. Oh man, it is. It really okay. is. So, what are we doing? Tell us about the movie. Tonight, we yeah. are going to be talking about Joe versus the Volcano, John Patrick Shanley's film from 1990 that I think most people would probably gr- agree uh, did not fare very well and uh, was was pretty divisive as far as uh, people's opinions of it. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, uh, there seems to be uh, a, a sort of vibe about this movie where you either get it or you don't. Yeah. And unfortunately there were a lot more people who didn't. Yeah. A lot of people. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because it's such a great, great movie that I think has, has, uh, stood the test of time. I mean, sure. It has its issues, you know, some things that it tried to do that, that didn't work, but for the most part, it's, it's such an amazing story. I have, I have a line here that I wrote down somebody and I unfortunately can't <laughs> recall who, um, who said this, but somebody I'll claim, uh, said it's an existential comedy with adventure and romance. <laughs> And, and I think I think that's you know, I think that the existential part I think is what that's the problem that right. what makes it tricky for people and the fact that it also is designed as a fairy tale. Yeah, you know, it's this it's this myth about taking risks in your life that I th- I think what happened is too many people went in and I will say I think a big part of the problem was the marketing. When this film came out, it was designed as kind of a Tom Hanks comedy. You know, this was around the time he was doing The Burbs, Turner and Hooch, yeah, uh, those films. Uh, and it which, was it ended up I being, love, <laughs> but <laughs> it was his first movie uh, with Meg Ryan, right? First yes. of many, first of three, right? M- that were all the same, <laughs> so <laughs> except for this one. So except for this one. So watch this one. Uh, you know, you were going to say something else. You said uh, too many people went in, and then you got off on something else. But I want to hear the end of that sentence. Well, too many people went in expecting it to be another just kind of a silly Tom Hanks comedy with you know with fun and you know money pit laughs and and just all the the goofball humor that was going on. Um, and I think it had some of that, but because this film dug deeper and it, it really looked, um, in a, it it was designed in a way, like I said, a fairy tale where we see a story where things happen that are completely, you know, things that can't really happen in the world, you know, like the whole idea of the volcano Island at the end, um, the human sacrifice doesn't end up in the volcano. So the volcano sinks the whole Island and that's the end of that society. (laughs) You know, I know it wipes a whole culture <laughs> yeah. off the planet. I mean, uh, you know, other than Al Gore and the the rising ocean levels, there's no one else who can do that uh, except in a fairy tale. <laughs> and so, so that's what 
Uh, that's that's what happens in this. And I think what happened at the end of this film, people saw that and were instantly like, oh, this is so over the top and ridiculous. I, I completely can't get into this because it's it's just nonsense without realizing what the story was actually doing. So that okay. was my long-winded explanation. I, I like that long-winded explanation. Before we get too far into, you know, talking about the the film itself, uh, t- let's talk a little bit about John Patrick Shanley. Because, I, you know, I find this movie... Uh, I find this movie interesting in the collection of movies that he has written. He hasn't directed very many movies. No, very uh, few. Uh, uh, very few. I think two, right? Is, is, am, I, am I right on that? Uh, well, he directed doubt. this and Doubt. Yeah, I think that was it. Doubt and this, right? Um, I, where? Do, how does this movie fit with the the catalog of of Shanley films? So uh, you you sort of have to. Say, this surprised me when I started looking at this. Right, the the um, he his first film that he wrote uh, was Moonstruck. Yeah, which was terrific. Well, it was terrific, and he um, won the Academy Award for Best Screenplay. For Best Screenplay, right. Uh, directed by uh, Norman Jewison. Yeah, fantastic movie, which we should talk about on yeah, this show. We, we should. And uh, then he uh, he goes on and writes uh, Five Corners. Uh-huh. Uh, n- not as memorable to me. But, it's, you know, it's, it's it was a good a, film. It's a yeah, good but... film, but, but, you know, it was, uh, you know, Tim Robbins, Jodie Foster... Um, John Turturro, always fantastic. John Turturro, uh, but uh, but you know that do, it just doesn't stand out to me. What stands out to me is the next one, which was uh, January Man, uh, which I believe was a, a, a this was a follow on to a Fish Called Wanda. Wasn't this after Fish Called Wanda for uh, Kevin Klein? Yeah, it was the it was the following year, and and uh, didn't. Uh, I don't remember this one working very well either. It was terrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a terrible, terrible. I mean, it film. was, it was, it. I don't know how much it cost to make, but it made like four million dollars. Like, it well, was it was not. not I a think good it movie. was a, it was a comedy thriller that didn't have any <laughs> thrill. <laughs> it was neither thrilling nor funny. <laughs> and it just, and it, as I recall, it just there was not a lot of logic to it. I think the design was like maybe he was going for more of a character study of these people or something, but. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It it's was, interesting. You know, because... you don't put Harvey Keitel as the police commissioner in anything that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> that's right. I'm. I gotta. I mean, that just doesn't work. Uh, and so that that one that one didn't work. And then we have Joe versus the volcano. Yeah. And so this is the first one that John Patrick, coming off of January Man, John Patrick Shanley writes this movie and directs it. Yep. Uh, just following uh, these movies, just to run through the, the that which came after Alive in '93, We're Back, a dinosaur story, uh, which is an animated uh, mm-hmm. kids film. Congo, uh, man, uh, this was an adaptation. Uh, Do you remember the, what he said about this? The one? Michael <laughs> Crichton book. Uh, please, please tell. He uh, he said um, this was. Uh, um, actually at a panel that he was speaking at that you and I were sitting at. Yeah. And somebody asked, well, you know, can you tell us uh, why you chose to adapt Congo? And he said, well, have you ever heard of doing something just for the money? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And I was like, that's pretty awesome. (laughs) That one uh, really, really doesn't fit. That if if you look at the catalog, it really doesn't fit. No. Uh, And then uh, let's see, live from Baghdad. Uh, Michael Keaton and uh, the fantastic Helena Bonham Carter. Oh yeah, uh, that one was another one. I, I that was a um, it was made for TV. It was an HBO uh, special uh, feature. Waltz of the Tulips. I have not seen. Uh, I don't know anything about that one. No, I, nor do I. And then Doubt, which was uh, this was a a big one. Uh, yeah. Because it was uh, it, it was a Pulitzer Prize winning play, yeah, from uh, two thousand four. Two thousand four, sure. And this one uh, ended up st- uh, a, a a I think a I would would I would call this a a, a hit in its uh, in its vein. It made money. 
It had some yeah, fantastic well, was, performances. Oh yeah, it was. I think it uh, it um, did f- quite well for itself. I would um, I would think that just just by having the um, Oscar consideration that it did. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Its budget was twenty million. Box office almost fifty one million. So starring uh, Meryl Streep and the unforgettable Philip Seymour Hoffman. And lovely Amy Adams. Lovely and Amy Adams. Powerhouse Viola, Viola Davis. Viola Davis. Yeah. It was it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic movie, controversial uh, but very strong performance. So that's the that's the catalog of uh, films by John Patrick Shanley. Yes. Uh, so where does how does Joe versus the volcano fit when you look at the 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 John Patrick Shanley the JPS canon? Well, forget about the ones that he just did for the money because I think there's a number of them in here that were just for the money. Um, I, I think he's really looking at interesting ways to tell stories, first of all. You know, and I think that probably is what happened with January Man. He was trying to tell a story in a really interesting way, and it just completely didn't work. Yeah. Uh, Joe vs. the Volcano, he also told a story in a very unique and interesting way, and it really worked. Um, and likewise with Doubt, I mean, he... Even, I mean, the, the, the play itself was called Doubt, a Parable. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he was telling a story in a, you know, a specific format, uh, which translated, it happened to translate really well to the, to the screen. And Moonstruck, I think, you know, out of the gate just came out as something that he got down on paper and just, and told a fantastic, fantastic love story. But they all have really full characters. And even his plays, he's always written just really strong characters that have a lot going on. They're not characters that you you feel like you've seen before. And um, and I, I think that is something that spreads across all of his work, is, is a way to tell stories in a unique way with fantastic characters. There... Um... It, you, one of the things I like so much about about his writing, uh, there there are writers who you know who just write. You know they write for the money. They write because they enjoy putting words on paper, right? But there are writers, and I think John Patrick Shanley is is in this club. Uh, you know this sort of cast where you can tell so clearly that every character is is such a, a unique voice uh, that that this is a writer who is holding up this mirror through the voices of these characters to you. Each one of them has this unique lesson that they are, they are going to hit you over the head with until you get it. And when you get it, you will have that aha moment. And, and, and I think he is so expert about taking this sort of, of, um, of comedy, there's a pretty dark comedy. I mean, so, you know, I, I need to get the citation here. I was reading another review and it was, uh, a guy said it was the funniest movie about suicide you've ever seen, which, <laughs> uh, you know, I think is really, I, I mean, that's one of the reasons that so many people didn't get this movie is because you don't, you don't often, uh, uh, you know, take the time to look in the mirror at what these characters and what Shanley's voice through these characters is trying to teach. And I think that's a very powerful, it ends up being a much more powerful film than, uh, than, you know, you, you get on the surface. Yeah, I think it's an interesting movie because I in in well we can talk about this a little bit more when we sort of dig a little bit into the plot, but um, you know I think the lessons of the movie are far more powerful in the first and second act than the third. It sort of falls apart kind of comically for me at the end. Well, and I I think that specifically for me it's the Waponies. Yeah. You know, I just don't think that's ever worked for me. The, the orange soda, um, Jewish, whatever the culture is that they are. Yeah. You didn't. That that doesn't work for you because that's that's, I mean, that's I, never I, worked for me. Abe, I, I, Abe Vigoda works for me, and that's Abe, about it. Yeah, Abe Vigoda is always fantastic, yeah. and the volcano itself works for me. Yeah. But yeah, the Waponies, I've never. It's just never been there. It's never clicked. I, uh, you know, I, I teach this, uh, this class and I'm, you know, speaking specifically of this cast of writers that I, that I think are so, um, powerful. Um, you know, I, I count Arthur Miller, uh, in, in that, 
category. And, and uh, there is a quote from Arthur Miller that I think is, is so powerful and really gets to, you know, why writers write when they, when they are writing in this voice. Uh, and, and he was asked why he wrote Death of a Salesman, which is really the, the saddest movie about suicide that you've ever seen, um, or, or play, I should say. Uh, so he had these, he was asked, what were your motivations behind, uh, you know, writing this play? And he says, there was a smell in the air of a new American empire in the making. And I wanted to set before the new captains and the so smugly confident Kings, the corpse of a believer. That was from the Harold Bloom, uh, book on, uh, Willie Loman. That's awesome. It's, I mean, the corpse of a believer it is such a powerful uh, statement, and I, you know, now I'm I don't uh, who am I to say that that uh, John Patrick Shanley had any sort of uh, such grandiose ideas, um, but that is when you look at at what these characters go through and and this the individual sort of path that they're on, mm -hmm. uh, it, you get the feeling that they're all on a journey of of the same import in his yeah. head. Yeah, they definitely are. It's uh, it's it's a real unique journey of i mean somebody who's lost right mm -hmm. it's it's somebody who just doesn't connect with themselves anymore in a strange way it it kind of fits along with fight club in that way yeah somebody who's stuck in a rut and can't get out right um this this guy joe banks he is lonely he's depressed he used to be a firefighter he used to go you know fight danger and then he got scared and he ended up working at this awful awful place i mean it's just it's horrendous he works at american panoscope home of the rectal probe you know a, a, a factory at which they actually count the number of satisfied customers <laughs> that's right home of the rectal probe 700 and whatever twelve thousand satisfied customers yeah yeah Seven hundred twelve thousand seven hundred and sixty-five satisfied. Yes, customers. yes. You get a nice close-up as the number rolls I over. I love to it. Center. It is brilliant. It's it's filled with awful fluorescent lighting. It's it's gray. It's just well, you know what's dirty. So, what's so interesting? It even starts before that, right? I mean, first of all, the legendary Eric Burden uh, version of of sixteen tons. Yeah, uh, really. which is absolutely perfect. Uh, oh, yeah. it, but the the scene of them walking into this factory mm -hmm. is terrible. It is absolutely terrible. They're walking through this huge parking lot. They're actively throwing crap on the ground. They're all clearly depressed. It's it's the they it's about as low as you can get. They're all you know uh, wearing gray and black, and they look it's, just terrible. And it pulls back on this factory, and what you see is. Um, what I, the, the, immediately in front of them are these turnstiles as it pulls up and you see right beyond this grotesque factory, you see the city, yeah. right? And it's like they're walking into a prison. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that just sets the tone for, for that transition inside. And not just walking into this awful building, but the sidewalk itself leading from the turnstiles to the door is in this sh in this very unique shape which is like this funny lightning bolt shape yeah. this long and crooked road that any man has to traverse to you know journey through his life and all of these people take this horribly long and crooked road to get up to the front of the factory and that's a symbol that comes back you know four times throughout the film uh, what is that so that's uh, that's what you take from that i mean the uh, the lightning bolt uh, symbol is the that's the long and crooked road for you that's what i've always taken from it i don't know what have you what do you think no i you know i i think so too i just want you know you're the insider you're the hollywood <laughs> insider <laughs> that's what i've always taken from it it's the long and crooked road and i think at one point he even says the long and crooked road which is probably why i connect with that hmm. it's been a long and crooked road to get to to you know what's he say it's toward the end of the film it's been funny coming here to meet you or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at the script. I am trying to find that page. <laughs> <sighs> it's a very uh, different ending the film had than the original ending. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, well, I, you know, what was the, well, should we talk about the ending already? I feel like we haven't even started talking about the beginning. That's true. Let's start at the beginning. Right. We'll get to the ending. All right, so just, they're in this horrible place, and the legendary first line, uh, uh, Dan Hedea. Dan Hedea, yeah. Uh, I know he can get the job, but can he do the job, Harry? <laughs> I know he can get the job, but can he do the job? <laughs> I am not arguing that with you. I am not arguing that with you. Uh, I am not arguing that with you, Harry. <laughs> so uh, brilliant. Which ties in so well with everything else in the film. It's so repetitive. It's so lifeless. You've got this robot of a boss just re repeating the same conversation every time that you walk into the room. The uh, uh, the he he goes into his um, his his office, which is the a a small desk in a small room that is actually cordoned off by shelves, right? Uh, for uh, stacking catalogs, and this is the advertising library. The lighting is uh, horrible, fluorescent, flickering, horrible, fluorescent. And you could nothing works. Nothing works. Yeah. Uh, every you can tell it's the office of the dead. The coffee is cold. The creamer sits on it like little creamer island chunks floating. Yeah. It's it's just awful. Yeah. It is really a place of the dead. It is a place of the dead. And his first interaction, I think, with a person is with uh, Meg Ryan Prime. Yes, this is uh, as Dee Dee. Dee Dee. Uh, and she has, uh, this is th that great interaction that, uh, that, that sort of sets up the whole relationship of, of him with his, with his health and him with women and him with his boss. She said, he says, good morning, Dee Dee. She says, hi, Joe. What's with the shoe? I'm losing my soul. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How I you think... doing? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's just great. I'm losing my soul. Yeah, it says it all right there. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, it, he, um, so this whole this whole bit is to set up. He looks terrible. He looks awful, and his whole bit is to set up that he is, uh, uh, that he's, uh, you know, he's in a terrible place. They what? They, there are so many little elements in here that stand out. That that uh, uh, Mr. Waturi is on the phone, and 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 the tchotchke that he plays with. Uh, while he's on the phone, you know, the device that he passes time with with his hands is a is the prototype of the uh, artificial testicles. Mm -hmm. uh, and and other things I did not notice the uh, that I, as many times as I've seen this movie, the lamp. I know. I didn't get that. The lamp is the story. Yeah. Did you know the, that? And, it's it's the story, and it's the first time that we hear Joe's theme play by the amazing. George Delarue, who composed the music for the film, it the it's kind of a music box sound that plays when you plug the light in, and the lampshade spins around. And uh, in a pictorial version on the lampshade, you see kind of the tail of the film. It's pretty amazing that they uh, they put that together. Did you? But did you know that? That's the question. Did you? I know, did. When did you find that out? How many times did you see the movie? Just the first time you were like, "Oh, I totally get that. I'm so smart." Was that how it worked? Probably the second time, because uh, I knew what happened, and then I go, "Oh, look!" That see, I didn't know that until just now. It's been twenty years. All the little things you keep catching, uh, the, and you know that speaks really well to the production design of this film. The production design was outstanding, and I think should have been noticed uh, because it's just a gorgeous-looking film. The and you know we've already been talking about it. The look of the factory, the the death building that this building is. I mean, it's just atrocious. And then we've got the amazing magic of this lamp, and we'll talk about other elements of the production design as we go mm -hmm. along. But I mean, it's it's stunning. And I think Bo Welch did the production design on this, right? And how do we know and love uh, Bo Welch? I'll tell you in a minute. I hear you. Uh, I'd like to hear you whip that out right now, please. If you could. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not arguing that with you. Uh, I know he can get the job, but can he do the job? Maybe, he, maybe, maybe. 
he, he Mr. Watturi walks in and says, Joe, I put you in charge of the entire advertising library and swings his arms room. around. <laughs> I love the do not touch the main drain. Uh, uh -huh. Those elements of that you that everybody has in their jobs. You just know that there are these things that you always wonder about, but you never have the guts to go find out. Mm -hmm. So he goes well, to the... That's what the, yeah, that, exactly. That's what the story is. So anyway, go on. So, so he goes to the doctor and he finds out, and this really sets the whole thing in motion. He goes to the doctor. The, the doctor is, uh, uh, the fantastic, um, uh, uh oh God. Robert Fra Stack. Stack. Yeah. Uh, who is, uh, <laughs> Robert Frost. Robert. Fra <laughs> who is Robert? Where is Frost? my mind going? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, you know that Joe. Andy. <laughs> His mind always goes to Robert Frost. <laughs> anyway, yes, Robert Stack. Oh my. Uh, yeah, he goes okay. to see uh, the great uh, Robert Stack, who is his doctor, and uh, he discovers that he is in fact not well. The doctor's office, I think, is another one of those great, uh, great contrasts. It's just, it, it is, you know, it's never that. That's ne who goes to a doctor like that. The 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 waiting room is uh, like <laughs> all lined floor to ceiling with that like hook hook board uh, yeah. with the little holes in it. And the nurse is like this ultimate nurse ratchet. And then he walks into the doctor's office and the doctor's office is this plush mahogany like roaring fire in the fireplace. And the doctor <laughs> right. is sitting in the corner in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's just beautiful so i mean that the doctor's office again is is that exercise in in sort of you know wherever you are right now we're at, we're the planet that it's farthest from right uh emotionally it's uh and again it speaks highly of the production design from the masterful joe or bo welch <laughs> and how do we know Bo Well, Chandy? He well, you may have seen a few of these films that he designed: The Lost Boys, Beetlejuice, The oh. Accidental Tourist, Ghostbusters Two, Joe vs. the Volcano, Edward Scissorhands, Grand Canyon, Batman Returns, Wolf, A Little Princess, The Birdcage, Men in Black, Primary Colors, Wild Wild West, What Planet Are You From, The Tick, Men in Black Two, Space Chimps, Land of the Lost, Thor. And right now, finishing up on Men in Black 3. Wait, did you say Ghostbusters 2? That I hit did. Ernie Hudson vehicle? <laughs> yes, he didn't have any involvement in the first one. <laughs> he actually also directed um, the some uh, episodes of The Tick from the TV yeah, series yeah. and the atrocious movie, The Cat in the Hat. Oh, I'm sorry about that. So, yeah, well, what are you going to do? He's got a lot of other good things. Cat in the Hat. Do you ever too. do you ever watch the uh, the animated Martin Short cat version? Yeah, yeah, I've seen that a lot with my daughter. <sighs> Come on, your mother <laughs> won't mind if we do. I know. <laughs> Come on, kids. <laughs> Why don't you get in my flying car? <laughs> your mother oh, won't mind. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little freaky. <laughs> Let's go talk to some bees alone. I, you're really scaring me now. Mm -hmm. That really <laughs> freaks me out. <laughs> oh man! Uh, Woo. Okay. All right. So he's in the. He goes to the doctor, and what he hears from the doctor is that he does not have cancer, uh, and in fact, he is not. He the symptoms that he's suffering from have absolutely nothing to do with his disease, with a disease. Because all he has is is uh, hypochondria. <laughs> hypochondria and a brain cloud. <laughs> he should be feeling fine, but he doesn't because he's a hypochondriac. Oh, by the way, you have uh, a brain a, a cloud. Brain cloud. <laughs> <laughs> what does he say? He says, so I'm not sick except for this terminal disease? <laughs> <laughs> And he's given what, like six months to live or something, a few few weeks or months yeah, to live. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, uh, I have a brain cloud. You have a brain cloud. A brain cloud. There's a black fog of tissue running right in the center of your brain. It's very <laughs> rare. It will spread at a regular rate. It's very destructive. And it's incurable. Yes. Six months. You can pretty much count on it being about that. It's not painful. Your brain will simply fail, followed abruptly by your body. You can depend on at least four and a half to five months of perfect health. <laughs> uh, and he's just the right man he to deliver all of that. was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Because you just, everything Robert Stack says, you have to believe. 
You do. And that I, goes for yeah. Robert Frost, too. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Frost was very believable. Uh, okay, so he, 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 uh, so where do you go from here? Well, and then I think one of the most touching scenes of the film, once he's found out he's dying, he walks out of the doctor's <laughs> office, and we're listening to <laughs> Ray Charles singing Old Man River. Beautiful rendition. And it's just Joe. And, and it's funny because you see the exterior of the doctor's office, and it is exactly the opposite of what we just saw in the doctor's office. It's a horrendous office. I mean, a horrendous <laughs> exterior of this dumpy little building. Now, yeah, and Joe yeah. goes, and, and there's this woman walking her Great Dane. And <laughs> Joe, in all of his, uh, you know, feeling very depressed, right. hugs the lady, and then he hugs the Great Dane. <laughs> the great day who doesn't really want to be touched by Joe <laughs> takes a little bit. <laughs> oh, it's it's great. It is it is a great moment. It's a great moment in front of a in front of a building. This building is perfect. Nine forty one uh, is the building. I don't know. It's, what is the significance of the address? You know, there's got to be something. I don't know. That's what a I, good question, though. What I love so much about the building is that they they found this building with a giant facade. Uh -huh. And this and the brickwork is just solid brick, and it's massive. And they pull out, and it the it's like the building never ends. Yeah, right. And, and it makes him look so small. And it's this oddly placed staircase coming down from like the second story down to the ground level on this wall. Yeah, it's 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 so funny looking. And down to his little tiny car. His little <laughs> tiny car. And then that scene ends with him coming back to work. He sees the flower that somebody stepped on earlier, uh, and he gently lifts it back up, and it, it kind of is a turn for him. Yeah, and it, it, you know that's you know essentially his um, the uh, inciting incident here in the script that pushes him into the rest of the story. So the uh, you know we've we could I think we could do scene by scene for the next two and a half hours. Uh, as we walk through it. So we easily could. We easily could. And so in, with that in mind, let's... Uh, let's there, not. <laughs> there are the transformative moments. And yes, to me, well, the next one is telling off Mr. Waturi, which happens to be right now. In the film. <laughs> which happens to be the very <laughs> next scene. <laughs> but we will but skip let's not many go after scene by that. Scene. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the next scene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're not going to do that, but we are going to talk about the telling off. Yes. Uh, and and he uh, and so he goes in and he, he takes off his hat, and you can tell by the look of his face. Tom Hanks he plays this transition so perfectly. You can tell the second he walks in the door that uh, uh, you know he's still talking. Mister Waturi is still talking to Harry as Tom Hanks chucks his hat in the trash can and starts messing with people. Let me call you back. I've got something here. Okay. And don't tell him anything until we finish our conversation, okay? And then he starts, he's like throwing paper away. He's, he's like messing with, uh, with Dee Dee and, uh, uh, and he starts acting with artificial all of the testicles. artificial testicles and the artificial hand. And, and you can tell like this is, this is the moment as he's arm wrestling the artificial hand. This is the moment he is taking back his life right now. I yeah. love that. I love that bit. And he, yeah, he, and then he asks Dee Dee out and it's, it's beautiful. He's finally had something happen in his life that breaks through that wall of fear that he's been living all this time. Right. And he's able to now step through and say, you know what? I'm dying. I'm going to take a risk again. Yeah. It's pretty powerful. It's really powerful. So that that is the first big transformational moment. He asked Dee Dee out. It is a beautiful, a beautiful speech, and it's the one that uh, uh, it, it's one that I really uh, <laughs> I really stick to. Uh, uh, or I really go back to whenever I'm thinking about uh, 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 about making a big change in my life. You know, when he says when he says I've been here for four and a half years. The work I did here, I probably could have done in five, six months. That leaves four years left over. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do a lot of these high angles, you know, where they're looking down at him from the from the perspective of the light uh, as he's as he's screaming about four hundred bucks a week. Yeah, uh, it's just a perfect moment. It and is. 
It's, and, it's, yeah. As he, yeah. And as he walks through the books that he's had in his desk that he's never read, which again, tell the story of the movie, Robinson Crusoe and the Odyssey. Romeo and, and Juliet. And Romeo and Juliet. It's perfect. Pulls out his ukulele. Yeah, yeah. Ukulele. All right. So what's the, what's the next transformational moment for you? Well, <laughs> is it the scene. next scene? <laughs> it will. And I, I, you know, I don't want to talk about the next scene only to say again, a, a wonderful example of the production design by Joe. Uh, I keep saying Joe because we're talking about Joe, but Bo Welch. Um, Bo we Welch see of, the of date the tick? with what's that of the tick fame, the, the tick and, yes. and Ghostbusters too. <laughs> that's, that's the one. Ah, and space does, chimps and space chimp he does great work he's, all right he's, he's the man he um after this wonderful dinner between the two where we really get a sense that they're falling in love and there's a connection happening we see them uh we see the restaurant that they've been in outside of which there is a billboard uh, featuring a an image of like a tropical island paradise, like come to the come to the tropics or something like that. <laughs> so we've got that. We've got the sailor standing under the street light. So it's got that iconic image of, you know, that travel and adventure with the seas. And then the cityscape itself, instead of just the city at night, what they actually did is they went in and all of the different buildings, they lit up with a different color. So each building you've got like this all of the like windows at night are all red in one building and yellow in the other. Mm -hmm. It's just a stunning way to portray one, this magical fairy tale world that we're in, but two, the magic of love and, and the feelings that they're having right now. The it's, it's stark a, contrast to the gray that we have spent the last, you know, 27 minutes experiencing. Exactly. Exactly. So, so that's all I wanted to say about that. But it's just, it just goes to speak toward the amazing thought that was put into the design of the look and feel of this film. You know, it's funny though, I, as we're looking at it, is there any, so what do you say to the person who says, oh, it's really, they're, they're trying to hit us over the head. It's way too obvious. It's, it's a fairy tale right from the start of this film. It says, once upon a time, there was a guy named Joe. They're telling us right at the start expect you know i mean you know fairy tales they tell us a, a kind of a simple story it's a parable they tell us a simple story to get across more important messages so it's things that we've seen before because they're easy to identify with they're easy to connect to and because of that we're able to get a deeper message about the importance of doing something with your life out of the film well that was really well said <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> I didn't. I, that was that was that was really good. You you must be an insider, Hollywood insider. Uh, okay, so I love the fact that that uh, Meg Ryan Prime gets actually freaked out and is spooked off. Uh, that there there's something about that I haven't been able to put my finger on, right? Uh, but there is something about her wigging out and leaving the apartment right after they're, you know, they're supposed to, they, they start kind of hooking up and he says, I have a brain cloud and I'm going to die in six months. And she says, I can't do it. I got to go. And she leaves. Yeah. And yet he gets another chance Yeah. with Meg Ryan again. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this next Meg Ryan is weird too. Uh, the next Meg Ryan is, um, uh, uh, a gibbet. Flibberty gibbet. I'm a flibberty gibbet. She's she's Angelica. Angelica, Angelica Graymore. I'm a flipper to gibbet. Yeah. She's perfect. Uh, she is, uh, and Meg Ryan. I mean, I, you know, she 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 is great in this movie. She is, and you know, Meg Ryan's not done anything good in a long time. But I think people, and maybe Meg herself, I don't know. But it just really feels like she's not found the right roles to play anymore or she's yeah. not looking or they're not offering them. I don't know, but she's just not in the right things. And she did so well in like the romantic comedy genre. I mean, when Harry met Sally, Joe versus the volcano sleepless in Seattle, she really knew how to make those films. Well, what's so funny about these, uh, about, you know, this movie is that we see two, really two very different sides of Meg Ryan as an actress. We get to see her as a character actress yeah. And we get to see her as a, a uh, you know, the romantic, uh, you know, lead to this relationship. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I'm glad you said that because you're right. We're really seeing those two those two ways of her playing these roles. She has enormous comic range and a really sensitive, uh, sort of approachable side that makes you just have a total crush on her. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, who, who knows why she's not getting those roles anymore. But what she's, you know, what she's doing now is not, uh, it, it's no Joe. No, I miss these days of Meg Ryan. I yeah, do. I really do too. Uh, okay, so she uh, she meets uh, <laughs> she meets the great uh, uh, Mr. Grainamore. He he meets the yeah yeah he meets the great Mr. Grainamore. Lloyd Bridges. Uh, Lloyd Bridges. What a, what a talent, man! What a Looks talent. like I picked the wrong day to stop sniffing glue. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> so he, uh, so he is the rich industrialist uh, who uh, comes to Joe's place and tells him, you know, in fact, I'm going to give you a bunch of money to go throw yourself into a volcano because I need boobaroo. Boobaroo. And the only place to get it is this island. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, that in itself is awesome. So and this funny. so begins the hero's journey. Let me, let me, I want to take just a quick side note. So the, uh, the boobaroo is on par with apparently in the, uh, engineering world, unobtainium, which is what they are seeking in, in <gasps> avatar. Yeah. It's another word for that. Something that's unobtainable that these people are trying to get any extremely rare, costly or impossible material. And so boobaroo <laughs> is in the same world as unobtainium i thought that was a very interesting little side note all right now because i thought it was just a made-up word <laughs> well first of all that they didn't actually use boobaroo in avatar is really depressing <laughs> james cameron can missed the boat see, on that one can you see that can you just see what's his what's his name the little scrawny engineering guy <laughs> sending them army down into, into as if it wasn't bad enough they were getting i need you to go get the boobaroo <laughs> You got to go get the boo. I don't care about these tribes, people. Wipe them out. I need my boobaroo. <laughs> well, that would have been so good. Uh, I I wonder if they're actually Prometheus. That's it. They're actually looking for boobaroo. That's you know. Yeah. I you can't might wait. Might. <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, Lloyd Bridges. Lloyd Bridges is fan fantastic as he ignites the hero's journey here and yeah. and joe uh, begins his journey uh and so summarize the journey well very quickly yeah he he goes through two versions of meg ryan meg ryan squared and meg ryan tripled uh, not, not tripled Cubed. i don't know Cubed, thank you. <laughs> Although it doesn't even make sense, but yes. Alpha, so we, Angelica, Beta, who is and Delta. Uh, Grainamore's first daughter, and then we meet Patricia, his second daughter, and yeah. he goes um, on a boat with Patricia Grainamore, who is going to take him to the island of Waponi Wu, where he will jump into the volcano because these islanders believe that the volcano needs a sacrifice, and if they, if Grainamore can get this guy to jump in the volcano, they'll give him all the boobaroo he needs to make his superconductors. So that's the journey. <laughs> that <laughs> to is the journey. Quickly. And this is where, and so the whole, you know, there are a couple of highlight elements, uh, the, the, the sort of the people that he meets along the way, right? His, uh, um, his guides yes. uh, take, take the most interesting form. Uh, first, his, uh, his, the driver, played by the uh, wonderful he... Ozzy uh, Davis, yeah. uh, is uh, he is is the most unassuming uh, fashionista, <laughs> and, and and he he shows Joe uh, how to how to dress. Right, clothes makes a man, Mister Banks. I believe that. Uh, and uh, and so he first takes him there, and then he, then they go, and then he meets uh, his his next guide, uh, who is uh, who sells him luggage. Uh, very, and, very McGovern, which is so so good. Uh, uh, I need it? to get to that that bit in the uh, 
uh, in the script because it really is uh, it was so perfect. Have you thought much about luggage, Mr. Banks? <laughs> no, I never really have. It is the central preoccupation of my life. You travel the world, you're away from home, perhaps away from your family. All you have to depend on is yourself and your luggage. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is so perfect because the luggage, what, what ends up so important about the luggage is that it saves his life. Yeah. This experience with this luggage salesman saves his life. It does. An ocean voyage. Ah, yes, so. A real <laughs> journey. He is great. He is so great, and it's such a small role, and yet, uh, and yet, it ends up providing kind of an anchor to this pivotal piece of the of the film. Exactly, because these are hugely awkward things to be traveling around with. Right. It's the luggage of his life that he's dragging with him, but in, it does end up kind of saving him. You know, it becomes, it becomes the uh, the. I, I don't know what I'm. I lost my metaphor there. <laughs> it becomes something. <laughs> no, it was good. something great, but <laughs> I totally lost that one. Woo! I had such a good one earlier there. That was I, good. <laughs> no, you can, that's good. You keep that. Yeah. We'll just remember so, the first time. Yes, just to, just tell us more about Bo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so he goes to he stays at the pier wild, hotel, wild and and he uh, he's he's dropped off. Ozzy dropped him off, drops him off, and then we get to meet. Uh, so he meets uh, you know Meg Ryan, Theta, and uh, she ends up being the one that you fall in love with. I mean, he falls in love with. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all fall in love with. Who am I kidding? She, she's she's just great in this. Yeah. And, and, you know, also on the journey through the, we, we have the boat crew, which is, you know, it's a great little crew also, but a part of the journey, which we didn't touch on is the big typhoon that happens partway through and sinks the boat again, giving us a glimpse of this lightning shaped, right. um, the lightning bolt that comes down in this, the same shape as the sidewalk right at the beginning, destroying the boat. The luggage saves his life. He saves Patricia. This is another example of the fabulous Bo Welch, Bo Ghostbusters 2 <laughs> Welch. <laughs> and I think this is this is one of the most amazing things that I still think I've seen in, in film. The moment in the middle of the typhoon when he, he pulls Patricia up off of the deck after she's been knocked over. And the music swells. You have the full orchestral version of Joe's theme as he, as Joe Banks and Patricia Grainamore look at each other. They're about to kiss. Just in that one shot of the film, the production designers changed every single pulley on the ship behind the actors from the round-shaped pulleys that they normally are to heart-shaped pulleys. <laughs> Just oh, for the one shot that and is so great it's amazing i and didn't that know that either i had never made the connection that it was only that one shot i mean i know i noticed the heart-shaped pulleys but i always thought wow isn't that cool they decked that boat out with heart-shaped pulleys it's the yeah, one it's, shot it's just the one shot and then uh, and then she gets knocked in the water he has to save her the boat sinks and all that but yeah you'll never see those heart-shaped pulleys on the boat at any other time that is great yeah. Now there is it, a bit of a goof there. You know the, the uh, you know the boom arm the the arm should it, knock Tom Hanks handily off the boat as well. And somehow it doesn't. It only knocks her off. That's right. That's right. I've never been frustrated about that until now. I've never been frustrated about that. It's you know that happens. <laughs> eh, what are you gonna do? It is what it is. Yeah. It's it's a fairy tale. So they spend the next uh, they spend the next while on his luggage. They, he ties them up and he puts her on the luggage, and uh, uh, he uh, you know gives her the only drops of water that he has, and ends up saving her life. Yeah, only to be discovered by the Waponi Wu. You know, she has a line on the boat that I want to read real quick because I think this sums up a lot about the movie. That's good. That'll move us along. Yeah, she says. My father, being um, Samuel Grainamore, my father says that almost the whole world is asleep. Everybody you know, everybody you see, everybody you talk to, that only a few people are awake and they live in a state of constant, total amazement. Ah. 
That's and really I think nice. that you know that's we're looking at a film about some uh, about that very person. You know, Joe is that person we're talking about, the person who's asleep who is now trying to wake up. Yeah. And then he dances to come and go with me. <laughs> but you know, I mean I you know, I sort of feel like that's the uh that's the kind of um the 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 bookend to that to her line is you know you see him he's he's learning to open up through this journey and then he is alone he's in the middle of the ocean and he's dancing like a madman to come and go with me and you know you can just see by the movements in his body this is the very first time he's let himself do something like that yeah he's finally alive yeah and and then his moment with god or a higher power whatever you want to call it at night when the moon comes up and this you know talking earlier or going mm -hmm. back to our conversation about john patrick shanley this and moonstruck really tie in with the power of the moon and you know kind of that feeling that it mm -hmm. brings he has that prayer that he gives to the moon i mean it's this enormous moon i mean it's the biggest moon i've ever seen ever it rises and it's the yeah. most stunning moonrise I've ever seen portrayed. We see this gorgeous moonrise. He falls to his knees. He prays to the moon. And then he ends with, I forgot how big. And then yeah. he collapses into unconsciousness. The enormity of life that he, and, and the power that you can get from your own life that it's easy to forget is there if you just kind of fall into this rut of working with rectal probes. <laughs> Man, how many times do you hear that in a day? <laughs> oh, oh, man. Awesome. So so he goes off to the island, you know, and he and now he's confronted. He's con he's he is going to jump into the volcano, right? Yeah. So this is a man who's going to take those steps. He's not going to sit by idly anymore in his life. He's going to be that person who has his eyes open. He's awake and he is going to jump. And Patricia decides you know she's made a lot of bad decisions in her life as well she's been living under her father's thumb and she's finally going to step out she's in love with joe and she is convinced now she believes that she's gonna their love is so strong that she's gonna jump with him and this and then here's another great line when they're about to jump she says joe nobody knows anything we'll take this leap and we'll see we'll jump and we'll see yeah. Yeah. That's talk a fairy about, tale. Well, yeah. Talk about, you could say that about any relationship. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's exactly what that line is. It's just taking a leap of faith. I'm sorry. I've got the movie playing, you know, and I haven't gotten to that point. <laughs> <laughs> You're being all talking about the, the serious, awesome part and I'm watching them get bathed. Mm. That is one of the, <laughs> one of the best sequences as they as as she is getting this full on manicure pedicure and he is getting fruit like just shoved in his face and getting beaten with fish <laughs> and has an octopus stuck to his face and it's just <laughs> awful all right i'm moving on now what, what oh, were you saying it that's is, just it a great funny, bit though. it's a great bit okay so you it take is. a leap and you see yeah and so there this is you know a metaphor for taking the leap into any of the unknowns in our life, right? And it's uh, it's what a lot of people are afraid to do, and why a lot of people end up stuck in a place they don't want to be because right. they are too afraid to take that leap. And so they take the leap, and then this is you know I can even I realize you know this is we're sort of deep in the third act. They're kissing, the volcano's getting angry, and uh, and then they take the leap. Yes. And I just don't. I... You don't like that? Is it that, the part that you don't like when the yeah, volcano I, spits them out? I think that's, I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that makes me, it makes me feel dirty to even say it. That's okay. No, it's not that. okay. Because this, it, you know, okay, this is why I'm so torn. How well, do you write your way out of this as a fairy tale if you don't have the volcano spit them out? Well, here's my question. Is it that you don't like the fact that the volcano spits them out or you don't like the way that it looks on film? Like yeah, the way no, that, I think you're probably I think that's probably the latter. <laughs> Cuz I don't think I I don't think it was captured very well. I think it's a little silly looking at it now it feels a little dated. 
but okay, I'm watching uh, them jump right now. Okay, the steam comes up, and they're very clearly. It's just really not good. It's yeah, it is a little dated. I actually almost prefer the wide shot where you just see the stream. You see the stream, the smoke. smoke stream, like <laughs> spitting them out. I I like that. That is bit. actually funnier. That's actually yeah. funnier. And then the volcano sinks, and the and uh, and they both live. Yep, they both live. Ending they the both, fairy tale. Uh, sit, and this is where that line comes in that I was trying to remember earlier, which I did find in the script, where uh, after he's. Uh, you know they've kind of fallen. They they they're both alive. They're on his trunks, and everything's wonderful. And she says, uh, "Actually, it comes right after that. We'll jump and we'll see. That's life." And then he says, "Actually, I take it back. This jump backward. This is right before they jump into the volcano." Mm -hmm. He says, "I saw the moon when we were out there on the ocean, shining down on everything. I'd been miserable for so long. Years of my life wasted, afraid." I've been a long time coming here to meet you. A long time on a crooked road. That's it. So that's the line. <sighs> Good stuff. Okay. So this is the, they, they look at each other. They jump in a slow-mo stylized leap. Right after they jump in, the platform slides into the volcano, which looks like a face. The face grimaces. We hear a gastronomic groan. Then the volcano spits out Joe and, Patri and Patricia, who are holding hands, rocketing mm -hmm. against a background of fire and explosions, come rocketing right at us and by the camera. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it didn't quite play out like that. No. Man, in the other they should remake this in 3D. <laughs> <laughs> they could come right into our eyes. <laughs> yeah, that might be a little much. Okay, so what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to uh, mention the other version of the script and yeah. how it's a little different. And I think actually this version is much better. The other ending, I think, was uh, it just felt a little sloppier um, because as they come back up and they're you know trying to figure out how they're going to um, make it back to shore, being on out in the middle of the ocean mm -hmm. uh, with no island or boat around them anymore they um come across um another boat that happens to be there and it's her father's boat with her father and the doctor on it mm -hmm. and it's this little you know battle that ensues or whatever where they kind of take over the boat and and you know get these guys and realize the scheme that they had hatched to it, it was involved with the with joe and the doctor in order to make this whole thing happen right it was just it was just kind of an unnecessary ending right too much too it, it was, was that uh, believe it or not that's that would have been heavy-handed yeah <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> you know this is one of those interesting kind of uh moments where the the final scene they they really it is just this uh uh, this little conversation where he he almost starts to slip, but because she reminds him that he is actually free, uh, that even though they're stuck on the ocean, they took a chance and they lived, and now they have the rest of their lives, however long that is. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yep. It is. There's a lot to learn from this movie. I feel like a better man already for just talking about it. I can watch this movie time and time again. It's just such a such a beautiful film and it it has its problems we've acknowledged yeah. that but on the whole it's just such a wonderfully told story um about taking risks in life and doing something and just I've always always loved it uh so what are you going to do tomorrow uh that that really you know says that you, proves you've learned something uh you're going to go run uh, run with some bulls I am. I'm gonna go go uh, uh, chase down a tumbleweed, and you should you should chase down a tumbleweed. <laughs> Great. So this movie actually uh, didn't do uh, very well in the uh, no. box office, but it is, you would say, a cult hit. Yeah, I mean, it actually is a loss in the box office. Forty five million was the budget. Box office was thirty nine million. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> Didn't a shame. Do very well. yeah. But it is. It it definitely has grown to have a cult following, and a lot of film critics 
who who didn't like it, I think, now have have looked at it again and have come around. And I shouldn't say a lot, but there are film critics out there who've come around and now say, you know what? I see more in this than yeah. I did see before. And I Even, think that's important. It, you know, the uh, the Roger uh, actually well, liked it in the beginning. Yeah, and actually, I'm gonna let me read his uh, opening line of his review because I think it speaks very highly of the film. Gradually, during the opening scenes of Joe vs. the Volcano, my heart began to quicken until finally I realized a wondrous thing. I had not seen this movie before. Most movies I have seen before, most movies you have seen before, most movies are constructed out of bits and pieces of other movies like little engines built from cinematic erector sets, but not Joe vs. the Volcano. It is not an entirely successful movie, but it is new and fresh and not shy of taking chances. And the dialogue in it is actually worth listening to because it is written with wit and romance. That's that's really nice of Roger to write. Well, I think he's right. You know, there aren't a <laughs> lot of unique movies. <laughs> it, it, it that is that is very true, and that, that's a really astute kind of uh, observation. That is, it is a a movie that even even today, two decades later feels like a wholly original movie even with as much as it borrows from you know so many of you know, the sort of fairy tale fairy tale gestalt i mean it really it still feels like an original film right it does good talk andy yes good talk about a great great film and i hope you know i hope our listeners all five of them are over many we have <laughs> <laughs> I hope they all go out and watch this. They and should. I hope I hope they uh, are able to appreciate the uh, appreciate it for something other than what they if they had seen it before and didn't like it. Something they can find something in it now, or yeah. if they've never seen it, hopefully they can just uh, see it for what it is. And if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Yes, listen to your mother. Here at The Next Reel, we've been passionately discussing movies week after week since 2011. That's a lot of movies and a lot of conversation. Sure is, Pete. And to be honest, it's a lot of work, too. But it's work that we love. If you've been enjoying our show, we'd like to remind you that there are ways to support us, even if you're not able to become a member just yet. You might have heard us talk about our new watch page, where we've listed every movie that we've talked about paired with Amazon or Apple links to rent or buy the movie. Now we'd like to introduce you to our Originals page. Let's take a trip down memory lane, Andy. Do you remember what the first film we discussed on The Next Reel was that was an adaptation? Uh, well, let's see. It wasn't, obviously, our Indiana Jones series, because those were all original. Uh, then we did Charlie Kaufman. Uh, oh, of course, it was Adaptation uh, from Susan Orlean's Orchid Thief. Exactly. We have covered quite a few adaptations over the years, and now we're providing a way for our listeners to delve into the original source material. That's right. Just head over to thenextreel.com slash originals, and you can see the list of all the adaptations that we have discussed. From our David Fincher series, featuring The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Social Network, Zodiac, Benjamin Button, and Fight Club. To our Paranoia trilogy with The Parallax View and All the President's Men, we have covered a variety of adaptations. Those were some great discussions, especially Fight Club. And let's not forget our baseball series with The Natural and Field of Dreams, adapted from Shoeless Joe. And Up in the Air and Thank You for Smoking. So many memorable conversations. Absolutely. And you know what's exciting? Each purchase you make through our links doesn't cost you any extra, but a percentage goes to support the next reel in our family of shows. You can support us while diving deeper into these fantastic stories, whether it's the paper, audiobook, or Kindle version. We've also included plays and movies. If they were the source, we've put it on there. So what are you waiting for? Head to thenextreel.com slash originals, support the next reel, and get your next great read today. I'm off to reread Fight Club. Now, where did I put my Kindle? 